mouth is. Tobias is going to tell us what happened when he did just that. Let's welcome him with a heartfelt round of applause. Thank you very much for the kind intro introduction. So today, or tonight, I want to tell you a little story. Um, I was part of a project in 2016, and today I want to show you some uh, takes on vulnerability disclosure and also how to do um, security research for medical device products. Um, some of you might have seen this kind of news articles. Um, they were out in 2017. Um, you might be thinking, why is this guy talking about stuff happened uh, in 2017? Um, there are such things called NDAs, um, and mine was for three years, so it started to 16, now we have to 19. Uh, that's why I'm talking today uh, about this stuff. Um, story is, um, there were some pacemakers out there with a lot of uh, vulnerabilities, and it led to a, a recall of more than half a million pacemakers, and also a new way for vulnerability disclosure was taken. So why do I tell you about this stuff? So let me first introduce uh, me briefly to you. My name is Tobias. Um, I work as security researcher, and mainly I do IoT, embedded systems uh, security, and one of my main area of interest is uh, reversing wireless uh, communication. And back in 2015, I did a talk at uh, Black Hat, uh, focusing on SIGPI security. And some, guy from, uh, some guys from a company called Medsec, were, they were watching this talk and said, OK, hmm, uh, we also have an uh, interesting project uh, concerning reverse engineering, reverse engineering wireless communication. Maybe hire this guy. So um, this company was called Medsec. Yeah, they are interested in medical device security. Um, and they had a project um, with the goal to find zero-day vulnerabilities in pacemaker communication. And they assessed four vendors, and I was part of the team uh, doing reverse engineering for the St. Jude's uh, project. Yeah. So quick introduction, yeah, how does the ecosystem of modern pacemakers look like? So you have a pacemaker that's implanted, yeah, um, medical term is implanted cardiac device, an ICD, um, that's connected to either a programmer um, that's usually at the hospital or at the doctor. So you can do calibrations, um, reading the health uh, data out of the system, and send it back uh, to the cloud, the Merlin net in this case, because there is always a cloud, uh, also in medical uh, nowadays. Um, they also have a home monitor um, that's used for, uh, I think, some comfort uh, for the customers, because usually they had to go to the doctor's office regularly to just to have uh, the stuff inspected, if it works, what are, the, uh, what are the data, um, and just to have it double-checked by the, by the doctor. Nowadays, the stuff is collected automatically uh, using uh, wireless communication, so you just have it in your home, usually in your bedroom, and as soon as you're uh, within the range of the system, your data is uh, collected and sent back to the cloud. That's kind of a uh, predictive maintenance for, uh, for humans. Um, and it's quite a, a big step uh, for patients. Um, but that's also uh, a first attack vector, because in the past, this was done by near-field communication. So you had to be really, really close by to get a connection to the pacemaker. But uh, they switched it up. It's now... Um, yeah, a different uh, frequency band. It's called the mix band for medical devices. It's 401 to 406 megahertz. And we chose this as a first attack vector and said, OK, it would be cool um, to shock a pacemaker using wireless. So that's easy nowadays, because uh, hardware uh, made a, a huge uh, progress uh, the last years. Yesterday, there was a very interesting talk about the limitations of software defined radio. Yeah, um, I can highly recommend uh, to watch this talk because uh, a lot of the stuff I have uh, experienced by myself, uh, especially the limitation side. So have a look at it. Okay, so we used software defined radio uh, to inspect uh, the mix band um, to find first attack vector. So how do you do this? Because 
you don't have any information where to start. So first we do wireless reverse engineering and I want to just to give you a short introduction what's yeah, my best practice uh, for doing this. Um, not for the pacemaker, but in general, uh, I would strongly recommend to check uh, something called the FCC ID. Every product sold in the US uh, has to be uh, checked by the FCC and you get a label with a number uh, and you can connect this number uh, to oh, wrong direction to some information because there is uh, online a database where you find uh, some stuff uh, from the testing procedure uh, and if you're lucky uh, sometimes you just have one device uh, and you don't want to open it because you maybe you damage it but you want to get to know of the internals and if you're lucky you will find on this website uh, also, uh, stuff like internal what moment internal photos, oh, the block diagram, user manual. So that's a very good uh, first uh, st uh, start uh, to investigate uh, a wireless device. Also, I can recommend uh, check patents. Uh, Google has a patent search online. Um, you won't find the most detailed information, but uh, sometimes you find. Um, specificas of protocols. So how does this communication work in general? Um, also a nice point to check. And of course product documentation, our FCHIP specs, firmware, software, whatever you get, have a look at it, uh, take this information, it will speed up your process of reverse engineering uh, drastically. Um, if everything doesn't work, fall back to visual uh, signal inspection, yeah? but that's a very hard task and you have to be kind of experienced uh, to do it and yeah, I would not recommend uh, to start with this. With this. Um, okay, also frequency bands for legal issues. Radio spectrum is very wide, so where, where to start? For medical devices, obviously have a start at the mix band uh, because it's just reserved for this uh, as a start and what we also this did was interviews interviews is always good um, ask people they have experience with this tooling what are the problems um, sometimes they can't tell you how, how it works but they have experience in troubleshooting maybe they say okay uh, if we have a lot of Wi-Fi networks for example uh, our stuff did not work so you can think mm, maybe there is a problem with uh, some interference from Wi-Fi and it doesn't work. Um, we also used an additional service. Um, the company bought the service that hooks you up with former employees uh, of uh, companies. So we got access to former developers. Uh, they worked there. We talked with them Yeah, what, what they think uh, the problems are on a security perspective, um, where to start. Um, sometimes uh, they, they gave us good hints uh, where to have a look at but uh, I will touch it uh, later on. Okay, um, Google Patent, as I told, that's an example from Zigbee, but you see there is a description how the basic networking wo uh, works. Also, RF chip documentation, what would I check? The, by the way, that's not uh, the transceiver chip uh, from the pacemaker, but that's a good example. Uh, for example, it's listed what kind of modulations are supported uh, and what frequency uh, ranges are supported and also what data rates. Um, legal issues, so the, the radio spectrum is highly regulated. If you have a look for something that you think is not uh, at the ISM bands, have a look here. Um, maybe it has also a dedicated, um, some, uh, some dedicated space. We did the stuff, gathered some information, did some basic testing. We started with uh, simple replay attacks, so we just recorded communication and played it back uh, to the ICD. And what happened was uh, we nearly instantly f uh, found first vulnerabilities. Uh, what kind of vulnerabilities? First, we called it crash attack. Yeah? It was no attack, they just crashed. If you replayed a communication for some time, um, the pacemakers, they just crashed and they, did, uh, they didn't recover. Uh, so we're, you were not able to use them again. Uh, there, there was no fail safe, no, no safety, no security mode. They were just broken. Yeah? Uh, so we break devices just by simply replaying stuff. It was, at now is still my most, the major concern I have because that's no real yeah, advanced attack. It's just, this might happen by, by, by accident. Yeah? Um, and we also found a way to uh, deplete the energy very, very fast. 
um, that's a problem because you have limited uh, energy, uh, so you can't uh, reload uh, uh, the battery. So if your battery is out, you need to have a surgery and you have to have it replaced. So this means um, yeah, also very, very bad. Um, we released some uh, videos, or we, uh, the, the company called Medsec, released videos online uh, about this. They are still on there. I put some uh, the references on there uh, if you wanted to see it, the proofs, uh, how this works. Um, funny side story, there is one comment on there. Um, because the videos are not <laughs> have a very great production uh, quality. And I like the comment. Yeah, I think it's kind of funny. And yeah. So replay attacks, first uh, vulnerabilities identified. But then uh, we dig, uh, dug a little bit deeper and did some real uh, reverse engineering. So we got our hands on the basic uh, packet structure. We found out, OK, where does it start? Where is the synchronization? Which CSC they're using? What do they do for error correction? But we still struggled with the data blocks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> In RF, there are a lot of ways to cover up your stuff. Yeah, you can do data whitening, you can do encryption. Um, it was not possible for us to yeah, find it easily. So um, we kind of got stuck. Uh, because reverse engineering is often a very time-consuming task. And since they had nearly every, only external researchers, it's also a very expensive task. Uh, if you buy like yeah, uh, 10 guys, Looking at pacemakers, uh, we are not the cheapest. I think uh, it costs you a lot of money. And also, even if it's weak crypto cryptography, you won't be able to break it with your eyes. Uh, just looking at it uh, won't solve the problem. So we had a decision, decision to make. Yeah? Get somebody um, who is um, good at crypto analysis or look at a different attack vector. Uh, we go, got, got for the second. Uh, because um, there is a lot other of other things to attack. Um, there is also a complex IoT uh, ecosystem, and you don't need to attack the the hardest target because everyone is speaking the same protocol. This means uh, we switched it up and said, okay, the pacemaker and the wireless communication directly might uh, yeah, be, be too hard for us to, to break it in time. Uh, let's have a look at the home monitor. Why at the home monitor? Because it also communicates uh, wirelessly with the pacemaker, and it's a very cheap device. So you can just buy it uh, on eBay uh, for $18. You can uh, get it at home. I brought one uh, today with me, just to show you um, yeah, how good uh, they are made. And we said, OK, maybe there is some stuff on there that helps us understand the protocol. So we took it apart and um, checked yeah, what our F-chips are, are in there, how they're working. And this took us yeah, uh, a little further down, further down the road. But a big, uh, big breakthrough uh, was we found some uh, debug ports. Um, they are not protected. So it's uh, UART, uh, just uh, hook up and you're connected to the system. And the bootloader is not very good protected. Yeah, you see maybe on the screenshot, um, if you are capable of uh, some basic stuff, it's easy to get root access there. Let me show you. Yeah. Um, pray to the demo gods that everything works. So I hooked up. Uh, a bus pirate uh, that's connected to my system and it's also connected to the pacemaker monitor I have. You see, uh, now I'm stuck at the login, so uh, there was the traditional boot sequence. What I now do is I just press the reset button. Let me. And you see, some stuff is, happen is happening, and I just need to press one button uh, to escape to the bootloader. Um, during the screen, you just see its uh, blob um, is used. Um, and yeah, we just have to wait uh, for the reboot. I press the button. So now we jump directly into the bootloader. Um, and you will see uh, there is written auto boot in progress. Press any key to stop. So um, yeah, that's easy. Help. What should we do? 
Um, just type in help, you see what commands you have. Um, there is one called boot. Boot is very promising. Uh, boot Linux in RAM with optional kernel options. Yeah, sounds promising because maybe uh, our goal is to directly boot uh, into the uh, into the shell. But how how to do this? Just type in status. You see your kernel command line arguments there. You just copy them. Let me do this. That's a very hard task. Boot. Just insert it again and. Add uh, just uh, one additional argument, and now we should boot up directly into the. Yeah, we don't have a, a login prompt anymore, so we have root access now on the system, and there is some uh, interesting inf information also out there. Yeah, typing is always the, the hardest part. For example, you see a uh, known host, where, where is it communicating to? Yeah, you see uh, the addresses from the Merlin net, from the cloud uh, listed there. What else do you need in a, in a cloud? You need a password, how to log in. Uh, let me check. And there is, for example, one exa uh, FTP password listed here. Yeah. And it's not a very good one, um, I think. There is some room for improvement. And this password is the same for every monitor. Uh, just some examples you, you find uh, very easily. So that's uh, not very sophisticated hacking, but it did the job. So we were able to extract some uh, components from the firmware and uh, go further down the road of reverse engineering the protocol. And what else uh, do we now have? We also have now control over a system that has the proper uh, RF chip for communicating directly with uh, the pacemaker. So the problem also mentioned yesterday is when you do software-defined radio, you have some timing uh, constraints because the, yeah, <laughs> there is some, yeah, in a, like in every protocol, you have some time slots, you need to reply in a specific time. And when you do this with a software-defined radio, you have them attached by USB. USB has a very high latency, so sometimes you're just too slow to answer them uh, in the right time to get accepted uh, by the re uh, receiver. So we just then switched to um, the Merlin at home as a tech device. Okay, what else do you attack? Yeah, um, programmer. Um, we also bought this. You can buy it on eBay. Um, we bought one recently from a German uh, second-hand medical device reseller for 160 euros um, with uh, valid medical data still on there. So um, I think the whole industry need to uh, step up uh, their game when it comes to privacy and uh, cybersecurity, just as an uh, example. So if you tear down this system, um, there's a re removable hard drive. No encryption, yeah, like Austin Powers says. They like to live dangerously, yeah. One of my favorite movie quotes. So this was our final piece in the puzzle. Why? Because there were Java uh, files, so you just decompile them, uh, have a look, and there is the, the, the whole protocol was just written there uh, for us just to implement. And not only the protocol, also uh, some codes they are using for kind of a backdoor access to circumvent encryption. That's not only to yeah, blame them, because for pacemakers, you have also like other requirements. If you go to Australia and have a, have a heart attack, you, I think you want that the doctors in Australia are also able to connect to your pacemaker and read some data. So they have kind of a backdoor universal key uh, for making this possible. Uh, OK. So we used now uh, the Merlin at home as an attack device. So we were able to deliver emergency shocks, uh, reconfigure the, uh, the device, make it vibrate, um, test shocks, the demo videos are still uh, on there, uh, on Vimeo, yeah, uh, the link is in there, have a look. Um, I think they're better than the, the ones before, so uh, they had a proper speaker, uh, I think they're really good to uh, just um, get what, what we are doing there. Okay, let's play a simple game. Yeah, uh, blaming the vendor. Yeah, which method message authentication code uh, is used? A, B, C, D, or E? 
So who is for A? A, B, C, close race, D, no D, no E, E, uh, no trust in the vendor. Um, it's actually C, so they're doing a little bit of authentication, but 24-bit RSA. What else did they do? Did they do the homebrewed crypto? You know, uh, I told uh, you about the universal key. Um, use 32-bit RSA public keys uh, or truncated keys because of memory. C, yeah. They did all of this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I th because you would be able to guess because when they use 24-bit encryption and then they have 32-bit keys, so they just they truncated it because they didn't have the memory. Uh, I, it's like a first project to do in, at university or at school, how to do cryptography and uh, do it the bad way. And that's a sad part in it because we have some IP cams, some Chinese IP cams in our office uh, just to get, to, 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 yeah, to get trained in the stuff. They have the same uh, security level as medical uh, devices. So um, I think that's kind of a sad part. So let's give you a short technical summary. So we were able to find in two months um, a lot of critical vulnerabilities with potential lethal impact. Um, so everybody, unauthorized users, could remotely just uh, disable your uh, pacemaker, uh, make them vibrate, deliver you a shock. Um, we found a lot of security mm, yeah, nightmares uh, in there. Yeah, No best practice was followed. Um, no, I think that's uh, very bad. But one might think, what about security certifications? Because medical is for certain a highly regulated area. Yeah? And you see there is a logo. Uh, it's ISO 27001 uh, certified. And they're very proud of it because they're the, 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 the first medical network that is uh, properly certified for information systems management system, information security management systems. Um, and they express it openly, um, they're very good at it, and that's a very stringent worldwide information security standard. But it's not, yeah. It has nothing to do with uh, product security. Yeah? That's maybe how they run their uh, mail server, maybe, uh, but not how they do pacemakers. Just keep this in mind, yeah. Um, this certification, uh, it's not for product security. Okay, but what was special? Yeah, because that's just a project with a lot of security vulnerabilities. That's no magic done. You've seen that's not the best hacking you need for the stuff. Um, vulnerability disclosure, and that's actually, I think, why I'm here today uh, and the next days to talk to you about what's a good way of vulnerability disclosure. Okay, what was special? Um, the guys, they hired me, and I thought we do the traditional way. Yeah? We do some research, uh, go to big conferences, uh, talk to a big crowd, and everybody will come to us and uh, buy the services we sell. Um, they did it differently. Uh, this, they licensed their research um, to an investment company, um, and the investment company took a short position uh, in St. Jude Medical and bought shares from competitors. Uh, this means um, they published a report with all the findings in there, not the technical details, but uh, with uh, the findings in there, and explained how these kind of findings will affect uh, the mar stock market price from, of St. Jude. So, vulnerability disclosure proce process? No. There were, was no notific notification to the vendor uh, previously, because there is a history attached to this vendor. Yeah? Um, this vendor was accused um, the same vulnerabilities um, by, by, by a guy called, called Barnaby Jack um, a couple of years ago, uh, but they were never made public because uh, Barnaby Jack uh, died. Um, so the research in this area kind of got stuck. And so they said, ah, ah, St. Jude, mm. they keep denying this stuff, and yeah, it was, would be just some litigation. Uh, let's just public, uh, let's just partner with Muddy Waters because uh, they are good at making these bad vendors 
uh, pay for uh, the harm they, they do. It's like a kind of a Robin Hood story uh, they want to sell you. Um, and as mentioned, this had a very big impact because on the day uh, the information was released, the stock market dropped 12%, uh, uh, which means $2 billion, yeah, 2 Milliarden. Uh, it's a very big number. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think it's the first time this was done uh, for vulnerability disclosure and for monetizing vulnerabilities. Uh, and I th think uh, a quite big one. And then it all started, yeah, because uh, St. Jude started to deny the stuff. They said, okay, these re researchers, they just want to make money off, out of us. Um, it's the, the, the results are false, they are made up, uh, that's everything not true. Let's sue them. And they sued a lot of the, the persons involved, like Marty Waters, the CEO, uh, the doctors that were involved in this project. And in October, because, also, uh, the report was published in August. And in October, um, we had a third party, uh, independent third party, to just recheck what the work we did. Uh, and it was an expert team from Bishop Fox, uh, an US-based uh, cybersecurity company, company, and they verified every claim we made. So we were ready to go and said, OK, we didn't made it up. Um, somebody has to take actions. And a couple of months later, the ICS cert released a vulnerability node, and also the FDA uh, released a vulnerability node together with a, a first update for cybersecurity. Uh, and St. Jude they said, yeah, we are proud of our security, we are leading the way. Uh, but that's not true, because the update was just for communication uh, between the Merlin and the cloud, because this was done unencrypted in the past, and they just uh, put certificates on there. So uh, that's not the update we wanted uh, to happen, because the pacemaker communication, the wireless communication, was still unpatched. Um, also, uh, uh, fun uh, st uh, stuff, uh, because there is a, in German, uh, a nice phrasing for uh, tödliche Schocks, yeah? uh, you see, Abgabe unangemessener Stimulationsimpulse is the proper word, the medical term for I will kill you with the shock. Yeah. Um, yeah. So everything is a kind of phrasing. Yeah? Um, a little bit later down the road, the FDA also took, uh, um, reviewed the information and they made an official statement. So, okay, they said, ah, that's true, what they are, what they are claiming, that's possible. Uh, St. Jude, you need to do a second update. Yeah? And they did. Um, uh, nearly one year later, uh, the final update came out, um, with, uh, which also targeted uh, the insecure communication. I never retested the stuff, um, but I think uh, there were a lot of knowledgeable people involved, so uh, this might be good. And we are back at the beginning. Uh, it ended in a big recall with more than 500,000 uh, pacemakers. So I think um, that's kind of an interesting way. But vulnerability disclosure, yeah? We have now the, the way we just push it out and make the vendor pay. But <laughs> funny stuff is that uh, nearly at the same time, uh, two other researchers from America, Billy Ryers and Jonathan Butts from uh, Whitescope, um, they're also into medical device security, and they reviewed pacemakers from, uh, from another vendor called Medtronic. So they did a security assessment, and they also found a lot of bugs and vulnerabilities in there, uh, especially in the ecosystem. So they were able to deploy their own firmware, uh, I think, on the pacemakers, um, using the, uh, the uh, software delivery system of, of Medtronic. Um, they disclosed it to the vendor and tried to work with the vendor to fix it. And yeah, you have a, a new vendor response. Um, so they also they reviewed it because they have an internal vulnerability disclosure process, um, but they found this is no new potential safety risk. So um, it's no problem if you are able to uh, deploy a firmware on a large scale to, your, to the pacemakers. That's no problem for them. Uh, has nothing to do with safety. Uh, and that's 
what very often in uh, in this position when you're a security researcher talk to vendors they are not, uh, they're not used to talk to security researchers and they try to uh, downplay the findings they don't talk to you they will come up with uh, a lot of stories just to don't fix uh, the vulnerabilities and um, one of the guys i think Jonathan Butt said um, for the time they just talked about the bugs with Medtronic. They could easily just fix it. Yeah? Um, it's just a question of they won't admit uh, they made a failure because this would affect maybe uh, the new regulations, uh, the, maybe the, 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 the payment from the CEO, I don't know. But it's very, very frustrating also for them uh, because two years later uh, the vulnerabilities were still in there um, and there was no patch out. So um, they were in the situation uh, still discussing with the, uh, the, the vendor. So this leads me to the point, what is the better way? Because that's the traditional way. Uh, and I think the more uh, yeah, ethical way in the, the broad uh, perception. When you get, go to the, to the first approach, you have one year later, you have an update. Yeah, sounds not the traditional ethical way, but a very effective way to do it. So what is the better, better way? I don't know. First, in this project, I was yeah, pretty pissed because I wasn't expecting this way of vulnerability disclosure. And yeah, then lawsuits started, so it was uh, not the best time. Um, but now, I think more open uh, about the way they took. Maybe this was a good approach. I'm not sure. Uh, and I'm open to discuss afterwards. Uh, let, give, me, give me your thoughts uh, on this in the Q&A. Um, let's sum it up. Uh, key takeaways. So first point, in medical uh, or in general safety and security, if it's not secure, it's not safe. Yeah? Keep this in mind. There is no safety without security. And security is not ISO 271 uh, certified. Yeah? That's not equal I am secure, especially not if it comes to product uh, security. Um, there are some new regulations out there. You need to do now cybersecurity risk assessments if you build a new uh, security product. Uh, we are working with vendors doing this stuff, but I think there is a lot of uh, room for improvement still. Um, problems they have, lots of potential new attack vectors. Yeah? It's like you've seen, you have a pacemaker, a programmer, uh, a cloud, maybe there are some apps in the future, maybe there is a lot of uh, interconnected stuff. So it's getting, getting more complex also for medical devices. So uh, you need to cover every potential attack vector. Yeah? Also the, the, the cheap end user devices. Uh, maybe they are the weakest point and the way into the ecosystem. Um, also, this way was a new way of monetizing vulnerabilities. It was the first time, and with a, a big hit, uh, especially on the media, in the American media. And it started a huge discussion about ethics and vulnerability disclosure again. Yeah. Um, it's like, I think in InfoSec, every couple of years, there's a discussion about how to do proper vulnerability disclosure. And I think there is no one way. Uh, it depends, yeah. <laughs> the answer from a consultant. Um, okay, then one last thing. Why this picture? Because it's my favorite picture uh, in uh, information security. Let me explain. Um, this picture um, symbolizes my uh, experience uh, in the project. Because first you start, you have a look at it up front. You think, okay, uh, seems properly secured. There might be a way to climb above and do some stuff, but it's a hard way and hmm, yeah, maybe they have done a good job. But if you switch your perspectives and take a different angle, one step by the, to, the, to the side at, uh, and to, to stay with this picture, it gets much, much easier, easier. So you have to really cover every angle uh, of your product. Don't go down the rabbit holes in security research. Um, try to uh, take a step back, get a new look um, on your problem, and maybe there is an easier way just right next uh, to the way you're in. So and don't think because you just you invested 20 days of research on this uh, protocol, maybe there's a second protocol uh, 
is also built in, uh, that's much easier to do. Okay, so that's my journey. Um, that's the story I wanted to share with you. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have some questions, uh, please ask them now. Uh, and I will be also around uh, afterwards and the next days uh, to talk about this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tobias. So we have microphone angels over there, maybe. Yes, he's waving his hand. We have a microphone angel over there. And we have questions from the internet, perhaps? No questions from the internet. Internet, step up your game. So, over here. Uh, just about the legal situation, the first question. Um, they just sued for defamation, libel, something like this, like you were lying. But isn't there also an aspect of manipulating the stock market? Uh, that's, that's the point, yeah. They claimed, uh, because due to this false information, uh, they manipulated the stock market, yeah. Um, I'm no expert in the law stuff, uh, uh, especially not in the American ones, but um, long story short, that's not insider trading, yeah. That's what everybody usually asks, um, because there is no inside information taken. It's a, a proper way to just uh, have a look at the books of a company, to do your own research and do an evaluation and say, okay, we think this company um, has no uh, outlook on the market, we bet against uh, the, uh, their stock. Okay, another question from this side. Thank you. Um, you didn't uh, discuss the role of the FDA, and in my experience also, in uh, cardiology, uh, we had a lot of outdated uh, amplifiers because they, were, uh, they had the certification, and they will still be used even though we could be build better ones. And I think this is uh, one of the places where it is also place is that the, uh, yeah, they had a system that was uh, allowed on the market, and it is an enormous uh, investment to, to re-certify uh, it yep. with the FDA. And I think that's the reason why they took a shortcut. And I think it's, uh, unless the, this whole system with the FDA changes, it, it's unavoidable that this kind of products keep on the market. All right, so the impact of the certification process. Yeah. Uh that's a very, very good point, and um, I'm completely uh, with you. Um, but I think there is a movement, yeah? They acknowledged uh, that's a problem, uh, and they will need to do a different kind of uh, yeah, a different process, how to get uh, updates out, how to get uh, security updates out. Yeah, you need to do some kind of separation between safety-related uh, systems and other systems, um, but they're on it, yeah? But I think now <laughs> it's still very like the old system, but they are at least thinking about it. And I know from some very well-known, popular uh, security experts, they are talking to them, giving them uh, input how to come up with a better solution. Hi. Great story. Um, I don't know if my question is too easy or too hard, because I'm not <laughs> really in the sector or anything, but I was wondering, when the zero-day exploit was um, uh, disclosed publicly, if somebody would have, maybe in the next week, used it to cause real harm to a patient, how is it likely that the company would have tried to sue you? Okay, um, good question. Um, uh, but I think that's an easy one to answer, because that's maybe my fault. Uh, we didn't release proof of concept code. We just said, okay, there is a vulnerability. Have a look at this video. This video proves that there is a, that there is a vulnerability in there. We never put out uh, the real code um, to, to make it happen. But um, to elaborate on this, um, what is the potential, the worst impact you can generate to kill someone? Uh, but there are other ways to kill people. And you don't need to, to pacemaker hacking, you just shoot them or strangle them, or run them over by a car. Uh, if you're not a politically exposed person, I think that's maybe not your most, the, the major concern uh, of getting killed by a random hacker. Um, yeah, if you have other problems, but for especially exposed persons, this might be uh, a way, yeah. Do we have any questions from the internet now? Still uh, internet, 
come on. I see a question over here. Okay. Uh, you said they had to cut 36-bit RSA down to 24 because of the low power hardware. So how do you think they were able to fix it with this hardware and build a proper algorithm? Yeah, that, that's why I always mention it. I, don't, uh, I didn't retest, retest it. And I had a look at a lot of the code. And I'm curious by myself. But I think they needed... I think there is still a way in there how to get kind of a backup access. Um, I think they just changed codes and protected them a little bit better. But if you have the same hardware, you have the same hardware. Yeah, you, you can't just do a different register size and switch from uh, yeah, to a different uh, key length. I think that's not possible. But I think maybe they did some compensative measures uh, in there. Uh, so, uh, but, um, yeah. Our very popular microphone angel over here has yet another customer. <laughs> yes, uh, you were talking about the US legal system, I assume. I uh, just want to add that if you were working in Europe or especially in Germany, you would have problems with the Urheberrecht, which is like copyright law um, when reverse engineering. Uh, there was a great talk on the last Congress about two uh, researcher groups from Berlin and Munich uh, running into difficulties in there being sued on the base of copyright. So be careful around there. I have to follow <laughs> up on this. The law changed this year, so it's better now for researchers. But what I, what I wanted to ask, yeah, great thanks to the U. What I wanted to ask, did you look at the CPU? So what hardware is inside these things? Is it really so low power, or what is it? Um, they have custom chips. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, but it's... I can't remember the, the specific processor, but I can look it up uh, if, if you want, yeah. But, but they did a, a, a custom solution for the stuff, yeah. Could it be that our lonely microphone angel has found, yes, a question? Just a very short question. So how much money did Muddy Waters make out of this? Uh, I was, <laughs> I'm still uh, curious by myself, yeah, there are no numbers out. Um, I just know that I didn't get paid for all of my work, yeah, because uh, as soon as they get, got sued, they froze all accounts and they set it up long term because the company was founded in St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, that's an island in the Caribbean Sea, uh, not even <laughs> in, uh, in the US. And they once explained to me by a beer, yeah, they had every lawyer on this island, so they can't be sued by a lawyer from this island. Um, okay. So they had a plan in mind already. Uh, but I don't know how much money they made. I think their plan didn't work out as they wanted it because the, the stock market, uh, the stock price recovered um, as well. But it, I think it was a, a huge outburst of uh, curiosity uh, at, at the beginning because dropping by two, mi two billions and uh, there, were, there was a merger ongoing. Uh, St. Jude was bought by Abbott. Um, so I think that was not the best uh, time frame <laughs> to get hit by such a market drop. Yeah. I see. All right, we have time right. for one more. Is it going to come from the internet? Hi, internet. Oh. All right, anyone else? No? Then, please, another great, warm, heartfelt round of applause for Tobias. Thank you very much. <laughs>